We've been having a, a, a scream, a fun time in this series called Might Get Loud. And we're talking about worship. Come on, understanding what worship is, what worship isn't. And uh, if you've ever grown up in church your whole life, I grew up in no, no questions asked church. You're going to church. You got the flu, you're going to have flu at church. You need to vomit, you're going to vomit in church. You know, sneeze, you sneeze on people in church. This is old school, pre-COVID. You sneeze on anybody, spit on people. You know, no, just, that's, just how it was, that's just how it was. A lot of tradition, a lot of different ways to do church, a lot of different ways to do worship. And uh, what I love about our church family is there's so many different people, so many different backgrounds, so many different expressions. Some people are super, super passionate. You don't need to, you don't need to poke them. They're just passionate people. You don't need to push them. You can probably tell where those people are in the crowd. You're like, they don't need no help. <laughs> right? And then there's other people uh, hurting, broken, made personality, shy, don't, not ex- very expressive at all. Maybe people are, you, you're used to singing different types of songs. You're used to different types of music. Every, every single one of us bring our style, bring our background, bring our tradition with us into church services. And listen, so here's your big idea of the series might get loud. We honor, we celebrate tradition. We, ce- we just don't worship it. Are y'all here? So you can bring the tradition. I have tradition. I have things I'm used to. We honor those things and we, we don't want to throw them out, but we don't make those the thing that we worship. We don't make those things uh, the idol. We don't, we don't look at those things and say, if it's not this, it's not it's not God. And so we've been, we're wrestling with that. It's hard when you grow up in a Christian area when there's churches on every corner, especially if you grew up going to church your whole life. You, you, we have these pre-expectations of it should be this, it should be this. We should stand here. We should sit here. This is what we should sing. And this is how we should, should sing it. And I think, again, we just have to work on who we worship rather than what we're worshiping. You know, and, and so that, that was the big thing uh, from last week, the takeaway. When we started part one, by the way, if you missed any of the points, I'd encourage you to go back and watch last week as we discovered who do you worship and how are you, how are you worshiping? Again, because I think the tendency that we all fall into is that we can become so familiar with our tradition and our background that that actually can become the thing that you worship more than Jesus. You can worship your experience. You can worship your expectation more than the person that you're supposed to be worshiping. This is what Jesus said about this, by the way, because this was happening all the time. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 15. It's going to be on the screen. We're already in. Are y'all ready? I already lost my voice three times the first service. It's going to happen. We're, we're in. We're not, there's no warm up. Okay, so get out something to take note. This is a note taking church. This is a picture taking church. Uh, let's lean in uh, and let God speak to you. Because we're talking about while we value tradition again, while we value our background, while we value our perspectives and our uniqueness, we don't want to take that away. We're just not going to make that the thing that we worship. And so this is what Jesus was talking about. Two religious people, people that had a background, who had an experience, who had an expectation. And now they're following Jesus and he says, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Jesus is about to come after us hard. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you that these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their lips may may sing, this is how I fight my battle. Hey, this is how I fight. It's their lips. They know what to say. They know what to sing. They know what to experience. They know the tradition. They know the method. But there's a disconnect from what's coming out of their mouth to who's really ruling on their heart. Now we're talking about what real worship is. It's not even just singing. It's heart surrendered. And this is what Jesus is after. He goes on to say, they worship me in vain. I don't know about you. I don't want to worship in vain. I don't want to have all the outward signs of worship and none of the inward heart towards him. And then we're going to focus on this, this phrase that just jumped out of me that Jesus said. He said, their teachings are merely, say it with me, they're what? They are human, human rules. I'm just all bent out. Of, I mean, I'm worked up. 
as a pastor of, of, of people that come from all different types of backgrounds and all different types of expectations, I am want to address this idea head on that I'm afraid that too many people packed in churches today in our city and all over the nation, that they don't even know it, but we're really valuing and we're really worshiping human rules. The, the thing that, that we love, the thing that we appreciate, they're, they're, they're human uh, rules. And so before I jump in, let me, let me clarify a few things from last week, some questions that I got. And the first question that I got, uh, and they were actually being serious, they said, Pastor, I just need to know if I, am I still welcome at Heights? Because you always say welcome home. Am I still welcome at Heights if I own a cat? And there's some of you that are like, ha, 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 what is he talking about? Ha, 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 I wasn't at church last week. You have no idea what I'm talking about because you weren't here. So you got to go back and watch. Um, so let me answer this question because I got, these are real questions I got. Uh, yes, if you own a cat, welcome home. We still love you. You can still come to Heights. Just don't bring your cat to Heights. We just, that's the only, that's it, you know? And so I can't be any more, any more clear about that. Um, but yes, and then the second question that I got was, Pastor, we talked about worship last week and expressing worship and all these type of motions and biblical worship, and you read Psalms, there's a lot of shouting. I came back today, this is like my third time trying, there's a lot of shouting again. <laughs> you know, people, some people, some people dance, some people lift their hands, and this is just, this is a little much for me to take in. But here's the real question, is it okay for me to still come? if I'm not there yet. So whatever your there is, is it, is it okay for me to come if even if I'm not there? And I had two things. The, the first obvious answer is 100% yes. This house got started by telling people and still tells people this is a place that you can belong before you believe. Amen. But listen, this, by the way, we didn't make that up. That was Jesus' invitation. His invitations to the first followers wasn't come and believe this. It was just, ready? Come and see. Because once you come and see, you'll taste and see that the Lord is good. And you'll want to do it. So just come and see. But by the way, you can't just stay there. Because his invitation went from come and see to three years later, come and die. If anyone wants to be my follower, he must, y'all don't want to, y'all don't want to, y'all don't want me to go here, right? Come and see. So listen, yes, it's okay, but there's a problem with the question to begin with, even if I'm not there, means you're so focused on where other people are, you can't, you can't go to where God wants to take you because you're looking at other people and saying, I'm not that, I'm not that, I'm not that, and I'm not doing that. Listen, it doesn't matter if you're not that, this, or that. Just start taking steps wherever you are. Start moving. Start moving. My job as a pastor is to lead and guide the flock to green pastures. And some of us have been eating at the same brown pasture forever because it makes you feel comfortable. My job is to poke you a little bit, nudge you a little bit, get you uncomfortable so that you can go from a... to a... Maybe I'll hold the TV. And you just... You keep taking steps. Are you all here? Everything about this church is move, next step. So you, it's okay. Take your time, breathe. You can belong before you believe. You just can't stay there. You, you, you can't stay there. Human, human rules. We're coming after human rules today about worship. Things that we've made worship that it's really not. Things that we've made worship, we've, we've attached our rules and our, our response. This is what it's supposed to look like. And Jesus had a lot to say about this. So let me just talk some of these about some rules of worship to help us uh, kind of clarify. And then we're going to talk about some of the benefits of praising and worshiping our God. Are y'all ready? Come on, let's, let's lean into this because I believe. And again, the goal, Josh, what is the whole goal of it might get loud? Is it just for volume? No, 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 no. The goal of the whole series, again, I just said it, is that wherever you are right now, that every single one of us would turn, would dial up our passion and our expression towards the one who gave his life for us. So whatever that looks like, again, for you, 
but it's move. It has to be moving. Things that don't move die. Right? So that, that, that's the goal. That's what we're doing. We're talking about rules of worship. What, what are the things that we've made worship that maybe it's not? Let me give you a couple. Jot them down. Take a picture of the rules of worship. First thing you need to know is that worship is not just music. It's not just music. I know it has music. Music plays a big part. But you need to know it's not just all about music. Because if it's all about music, that means it's all about performance and performers. And here's the deal about performance and performers. They're always worried about two things, how they look and how they sound. That's, that would be true. If it was all about the music, that would be true for them to you. But guess what? That would also be true about you to the people around you. How do I look? How do I sound? What are they thinking about me? Oh, those people might not be. No, no, no. It's not about, it's not about music. Why do you say Because listen, you can have great music and still no worship. <laughs> Y'all are right. You can have great music and no worship. You can have great singing and still have no worship. That's, by the way, when you've ever been watching like a professional, like the Grammys or what, what's the singing show? Um, you know, the, 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 yeah, you know, whatever it is. There's too many of them now. They're all whatever. But you can, like, when you're watching a performance and you, like, have ever been, like, watching someone sing and you, like, get moved? Like, you get literally, maybe I'll, I'm not, it's emotion. Like, you get goosebumps and you're like, that person just crushed. They don't, they're worshiping. They're just worshiping the wrong thing. They were, we, by the way, we were created to worship. That person's giving a sound and it's, listen, it's gifted. It's just lacking anointing because if it was anointed, it would be going to God. So listen, the whole thing about music is music plays a part, but if it was all about music, it would be all about them. And then what do you do? Well, let me answer that question. You come into play when it's about music because your body is a musical instrument. Oh, I wish I could preach at you right now for three minutes straight. I can't. I'm going a completely different direction. I don't have time. You are a musical instrument. Our voice, our feet, our hands, all these things create a sound that reaches heaven, that it, listen, it attracts God. So listen, when we, our job is because it's not just about music, is we can participate with our hands. Let's all indulge me. Get your hands ready. Come on, get that stuff out of your hands. Let's get your hands ready. Ready? Let's all worship God with our hands by clapping. One, two, three. <laughs> Go God, Jesus. That was like a master's golf clap <laughs> for sinking a birdie. Let's try one more time. Because we are, a, see that sound you made? We're a musical instrument. Let's all practice making a sound that worships God. One, two, three. <laughs> Clap. Clap your hands. No, stop, stop, stop. It's funny that you'll do it at a wedding, but you won't do it for Jesus. It's amazing that you'll do it at the game. They call you a fan. You do it at church. They call you a fanatic. Where are we getting these rules from? Jesus said human rules and you nullify the word for your Tradition. I just believe that there's some worship that God wants to see from his people in his house with the instruments that he's given you. Hands up high, clapping, shouting, lifting your voice, crying, kneeling, bowing, weeping. All these expressions of worship. Some of y'all are like, oh man, he's oof, scared. We're not done. We're not done. Let's go. It's not just music. It plays a part, but don't make it. Because when the music stops, guess what has to continue? <sighs> because I still worship on Monday. And I still worship on Tuesday. And I still worship with the text message that I send. 
and I still worship with the social media post. And I'm still, you under, so it's not just, it plays a big part, it's a vital role, but it's not everything. It's not just music. Rules of worship number two, it's also not about style. Write it down. No, you don't want to, because you love your style. It's not about style. Style is about preference, and I, I, I just think it's scary. I think we're on dangerous grounds as followers of Jesus. That we determine if we're going to worship Jesus based on how we feel about the style of music that's being played. If we like the style, oh, that's my jam, oh they finally played it. Or th this is too rocky for me, or I like something more traditional, or this is too much. Style can't determine your praise. Style can't determine your worship. And I just wonder sometimes what Jesus, with his pierced hands, feet, and his side, looking down at his people, saying, you're going to let your style determine how you thank me and honor me and worship me? By the way, just, just, just a side note, just for history. You need to study up on the history of the church. It's a gorgeous history, but style and preference is also why we have denominations. And I'm not a denomination basher. I'm pro, I like denominations. I think there's a lot of uh, good that comes from multiplying efforts and people have different tribes and different things. I understand that, but denominations started by disagreements. I don't like how you do that. We're gonna worship this way. You sing that way. We're gonna celebrate Easter on this day. You celebrate Easter on that day. And we wanna do this and we feel called to do that. And the very thing that Jesus gave his life to unite becomes divided over preference. So now I will church hop and keep church hopping until I find a style that suits me when it was never about you. Some of you have never heard somebody talk to you like this and it's not mean, it's love. I'm just telling you it's time for the human rules to come down and the true worship to come up. If you're a part of a denomination, and all those things, amazing. I grew up in a denomination. I love it. I don't worship it. And I definitely don't let it divide, divide me. Because at the end of the day, your style reflects your taste, not God's. Ooh, God's like Baskin Robbins. He's got a lot of flavors he likes. He can roll. Why? Because it's, about, it's about the heart. It's not about the lips. It's about the spirit, the heart behind the, the heart behind the worshiper. Is it so? Worshippers. It's not just music. It's not style. Number three, write it down. It's not about us. I can't say it anymore than what I just said. It's not about us. And listen, this is important because at times, especially if you've been out of church for a while, or you don't feel like you're in the end or you don't really know what to do and you're seeing all these people express things. Listen, a lot of times what keeps us from worshiping, you ready, is us. Oh, I don't feel like I can lift my hands because God, I know God knows what I did last night. I don't feel like I can sing. I don't feel like I, I can say, Yahweh, I don't want to take your name in vain when he knows I've been taking it in vain all week. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel, I feel guilty, I feel shamed, I don't feel worthy. Me, my situation, my family's a mess, I just lost my job, I got more bills and I got money, and me and this is, you know what's the common theme in all of those things? And I'm not saying none of them are true because a lot of them are. But the central theme throughout all of those reasons is me and I. And worship is not about us. And every single time we come in and you allow your circumstance or your difficulty, or your problem to keep you from worshiping. Listen, don't miss this. It's by design because it's based in pride. It's based in only, th what's pride? When you think only about who? By the way, no mistake, it's the very first sin that's ever recorded. And I'm not talking about Adam and Eve. I'm talking about Lucifer the chief 
worship angel in charge of ascribing glory, honor, and majesty in heaven gets boastful and thinks he should be worshiped. That's why Jesus says, I saw him fall like lightning. It's by he's still trying to steal what he lost. Worship. It's not, listen, it's not about us. I wrote it down like this. It's going to be on the screen. Satan wins every time we make what God created for himself and we make it about us. It's not about us. It's not about us. It's not music. It's not about style. It's not about us. That's not what worship is. Now this makes so much more sense and brings so much clarity and power. And should bring a little passion behind Jesus' words in John chapter 4 that we read last week when he said, but the hour is coming. There's been people that have, they've been worshiping with their lips, but their heart has been far from me for so long. But the hour is coming. The time is coming. Come on, follow me. And is now here when the, say it with me, the what? The true, that was six of you. Say it together. The who? The true worshipers by the way if Jesus said there's true worshipers that must also mean there's false worshipers there must be people that are making worship all about human rules but Jesus says the time is coming when the true worship worshipers will worship the father in spirit and in truth I love this for the father is say it the father is seeking the father is seeking yeah but I messed up and I don't know if I'm good enough and my past is broken and I come from an abusive background and I've abused people and I feel lonely and I'm neglected and I'm addicted and I'm hung up the father is seeking you need to know that the hour the time is when Jesus said it's now indeed it is here where the father is seeking you out regardless of your performance because worship is not about us it's about him the father is seeking you out the father is seeking what he's seeking true worship worshipers such people to worship him. And we asked the question we asked last week, if God is looking for that, come on church, don't you want to be that? If that's what God is looking for, don't you want to be? Listen, and not only, this is where we're going to pivot, I'm going to pivot to this. Because not only because God asks for it and it brings honor to God, but listen, the person that it ends up helping the most is us. Yeah, but Josh, I thought you said it's not about us. No, it's not about us, but there are benefits and there are advantages and there is power that we have access to when we worship. No, it's not about us, but God is so good. He loves us so much that he's tapped in this supernatural ability that when we ascribe praise and we ascribe majesty, it doesn't take away your problems. It just gives you something bigger than your problems to focus on. There's an advantage. Come on, say advantage. There's an advantage. So many of us, you're walking through life without an advantage that's right next to you. Imagine not taking taking advantage of an advantage. It's right there. That God wants us to experience some power and advantage that comes from worshiping and expressing our worship and love to God. I'm going to give you three of them really quickly and we're going to be done. Y'all good? Come on, help me. Don't stop. My voice is going. What is it, Josh? What happens when I truly worship? Because that's who Jesus is looking for. Actively, right now, he's looking. And it's not about your past, and it's not about your resume that he's looking for. He's looking at the heart of the worshiper. What are some things that happen in our life when we begin to truly worship and become a worshiper that God's looking for? Number one, write it down. Is when I truly worship, come on, it lifts up my weary soul. Ooh, that just blesses me right there. It lifts up my weary soul. Some, you know why some of you are weary? Why some of you are tired and, you know, you just, fit. come on, life can just get you tired. I don't know how else to say it. You just get weary, go through seasons. It's because too many of us, we've made worship that thing, that feeling. And by the way, worship is a feeling. It it, it is amazing. But so many of us have made worship, I'm going to worship when I 
feel it. Come on, y'all here? When I feel it. When they play that song and uh, when, when they do this, you make worship a feeling. And here's the problem with worship being a feeling is our feelings are inconsistent. Our feelings are up, then they're down, they're left, they're right. I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm happy. And they're all over the place. And when you make worship a feeling, guess what happens to your worship? Yeah. I'm up, I'm down, I'm right, I'm left, I feel like it. I'm going to sit down the whole service because I don't even feel it today. Sometimes Pastor Josh is good and he really just missed the ball today. And man, the worship team crushed it. And man, they missed the choir. I want the choir back up because I only worship when the choir's out there. Up, down, left, right. Listen, worship is not a feeling. It is a choice. You choose to worship. This is how you overcome circumstantial worship. So we don't worship just on Sundays when the bands, this is how on Monday when 11 a.m. and I already forgot that I'm saved, I choose to worship again. I make the choice. I'm going to worship. When you fight the whole way to church and right before you get out of that car in the parking lot, you grab your wife by the hand or your friend, you say, I'm making the choice right now. I choose worship regardless of my circumstance. Worship is not a feeling. And when you make that choice, guess what happens? Your weary soul begins to lift. Listen how the psalmist said it. Dave said it like this. David in Psalms 42, it says, Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so... Some of you here, you're watching online, you're in the room, you're discouraged. You're discouraged. You're anxious, you're depressed. Some of you are so sad and you don't even know why. You used to be a happy person, you used to be but, and life has robbed the joy from you. And you're managing and you're managing and you're managing. This is where David finds himself. Now watch the response. That's the circumstance. The circumstance is I'm weary, I'm sad, I'm discouraged. Now watch what he chooses to do. Next verse. So I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God, even though I'm deeply discouraged and even though my soul is weary, but I will remember you. Worship is a function of your will. So I will magnify the Lord. I will praise your holy name. I will open up my mouth. I will lift up my hands even when I don't feel like it because if I make the choice, my feelings will catch up to my choice. He goes on. Psalms 40. Pay attention to how this happens. I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned to me and he heard my cry. How many know when you're weary, sometimes you cry? I, I need to talk to some real people. I can't talk to halo people. Sometimes you get to the point where you're, the only way you know how to worship is to cry. Because you're so tired and you're so weary. But by the way, God can take your crying. He just can't take your silence. How do you think the Lord, how can the Lord hear if you're not opening up your mouth? He said, I, I, I turned because I heard, I heard their cry. He heard my cry. So what happened? What did he do? He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud, out of the mire, and he he set my, see, my soul was weary, but he picked, he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place. What you're reading for so many of you sounds completely opposite of what you're currently experiencing. And I'm telling you, it's available to you when you worship, when you express a worship to God. And so when God lifts you up, when he gives you a firm place to stand, what should be our natural response? Next verse. He put a new <laughs> He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. And by the way, many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Listen, if you're weary, turn your weariness into worship and allow God to lift you up. 
And it's okay to cry when you're weary. It's okay to, there's sometimes that is your worship. Is you need to just lay on your face and cry out to the Lord and patiently wait. Because he's going to come pick you up and set your feet on the solid rock, on the solid ground. When I truly worship, why are you making a big, why are we talking about worship? Because when you truly worship, it'll lift up your weary soul. If you're weary today, if you're watching online, let's worship. Not only that, but when I truly worship, number two, it is a mighty weapon against Satan and his demons. Oh, it's a mighty, come on, say mighty weapon. It's a mighty, there, our sound is a weapon. It's a, it's a mighty weapon against Satan and his demons. Some of you, you, you're fighting and you got no weapon. And you're wondering why your family's getting shellacked. And why no movement will happen in your marriage. And why your dreams keep on getting dashed. And why you keep feeling lonely. And why you keep having to, to, to take this and do this just to feel anything in your life. That's on purpose. You're fighting a spiritual fight without a weapon. And God comes along and says, when you lift your voice, when you cry out to me, when you worship me, you don't even know you're raising up a standard against the enemy. It becomes worship becomes Worship will become your weapon. I love 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, what are they there? That means your unspiritual, unsaved friends aren't going to understand it. That means there might be somebody in your row that looks at you weird because you're expressing weaponry warfare in a different fashion than everybody else is used to. They're not carnal, carnal, but mighty in God. I love this. For the pulling down of strongholds. Some of you got some strongholds that you've been trying to tear down and nothing's happening. Why? Because you're trying to pull something down that's spiritual naturally. And it's never, ever going to work. If you want to tear something down spiritual. You have to do it spiritually. Let me say it to you so you can understand it. If you want to tear down the spiritual generational curse that's been on your family, from your grandparents to your parents, now to you, and you don't even know why, but you're seeing it starting to take root in your kids. That is a spiritual stronghold. Listen, that God's given you everything that you need and the weapons that you need to break that spiritual stronghold off of your family. That stronghold of addiction that's been in your life and been in your parents' life and been in your friend's life, that is a stronghold that you cannot take down naturally. You have to win it spiritually. There's no Oprah, there's no self-help books, there's no 10-step program that's going to get it. You need the power of God at work in your life to tear it down. To tear it down. What, listen, our worship is our weapon. And sometimes you don't need to know anything else to do but to just say the name of Jesus. You plead his name over you, over there, and you keep using that weapon over. You, oh my goodness, you need to start using a weapon that works. Some of you have been using a weapon that doesn't work. You're using the same Phillips head screwdriver on a flat head screw, thinking the screw's gonna come out and nothing's happening until you start fighting and winning spiritually. That's such great common sense. Use a weapon that works. It'll work if you work it. <laughs> Y'all gonna mess around. It'll work. They, listen, I'm, I gotta move. Your victory, your breakthrough, that stronghold that you've been trying to manage, that you've been trying, listen, to take down... It is connected to your worship. 
It is connected to your prayer. And you don't have to be smart. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to have any. You can have zero church. When you have nothing else, guess what? You can start worshiping. You don't need a worship leader. You're the worship leader. Oh, my gosh. Some of y'all just got promoted. You're the worship leader. You're in charge of the worship that goes on in your life. You don't need the band. You don't need Pastor Josh to come and stir you. You're the worship leader. And that breakthrough and that stronghold that you just keep resigning yourself, that that's always going to be there. In Jesus' name, you start worshiping. Don't wait on anybody else. You start. When you got nothing else, you start praising. You start magnifying. And watch God tear it down because you're winning the war spiritually. This is what happened in Acts. You know the story. Paul and Silas, stop preaching. Stop preaching. We're going to throw you in jail. Paul and Silas, stop preaching. Stop preaching. We're going to throw you in jail. They don't stop preaching. After they had been severely flogged, beaten, they were thrown into prison. And the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them where? In the... Is it not up there? Okay. I'm just wondering why, why my voice hurts and yours is fine. <laughs> he put them in the inner cell. And he fastened their feet in the stocks. Oh, but about around midnight. How many know it doesn't ever happen at 3 p.m.? The sun shining, there's still hope. You know, bird, you can hear the birds chirping. You're like, man, God. You know, oftentimes God does it in the midnight hour. Right when you want to give up. Midnight hour is the loneliest hour. At, some, at the midnight hour, listen, nobody's looking at your posts. Nobody, you're not with a bunch of people around midnight. The midnight hour is when it's just you and Jesus. Nobody to impress. No pride. In the, no, 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 no. But around midnight, Paul and Silas were they were, pray, they were praying and singing hymns to God. Now watch this. And the other prisoners were listening to them. They were singing and the other prisoners were listening to them. Pay attention. Now suddenly, God doesn't need much time to change your life. He can do it suddenly. Suddenly, there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison in other words, the things that were holding them back. The foundations of the prisons were shaken. And at once, the prison doors flew open. And whose? Paul and Silas's? Everyone's chains came. Other prisoners were listening to them. Everyone's chains fell off. Other prisoners were listening to them and everyone's chains came off. When I was studying this week, God said, Josh, tell yourself and then stand on that stage and tell these people boldly and confidently that your worship won't just set you free. It'll set the people close to you free. That there's some people, listen, in your life that maybe you've been wishing would get better. You've been maybe thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if they stopped doing that? Or maybe it would be cool one day if they would come to church. And I'm telling you, the Lord told me to tell you and prophetically say that their freedom is connected to your praise. And as soon as you start lifting up the name of Jesus, other people will start listening. Other people will start being set free in the mighty name of Jesus. Other people were listening to their praise and then before you know it, everyone's chains. I'm telling you, your worship doesn't just affect you. It'll set other people free around you. Well, Josh, when? In the midnight hour. 
when, Josh? Because I've been doing this a long time and I don't know how in the midnight hour. So what do I do? Keep singing. Keep worshiping. Keep leaning in. Keep praising. The midnight hour. Stronghold, your victory is connected to your worship. Some of you, I'm going to close. Some of you are here. And you got some serious strongholds. You have some generational stuff in your life. You have some hurt, some wounds that you never told anyone about. You, you know what you, you need supernatural power at work in your life. Supernatural, not natural. No amount of counseling will fix you. You need to go to counseling. Hello, you keep going to counseling, but it, it ain't gonna do it alone. You need the supernatural work of God's presence and God's spirit. You're going to need to lean into this last one. When I truly worship, it creates an environment where the Holy Spirit is welcome. It creates an environment where the Holy Spirit... You'd be amazed the places that the Holy Spirit will go if you would just invite Him. You'd be amazed where God's... See, I think one of the biggest problems with people that know anything about religion or know anything about Christianity, we're great at compartmentalizing. Holy Spirit, oh, I need your power at work in this, but don't go over here. That's my messy spot. That's my hurt. That's my guilt. That's my shame. That's, that's the parts of me that I'm hide, that I'm embarrassed of. And so what will happen is we come and we'll offer and we'll invite his presence and portion. And God's word to you today, he's saying, if you'll just invite me. I'm not just the God of the mountain, I'm the God of the valley too. And if you'll just cry out to me, if you'll give me that broken spot, if you'll give me that sick area of your, if you invite my power and my presence, I'll come into every area of your life. Psalms 100, how do we invite God's presence? His Holy Spirit. Create the environment. We don't have to guess. Psalms 100 says this. It says, make a... <laughs> that was pretty pathetic. We're going to try again. Make a... Joyful shout. Make a joyful shout. To... Hold on, hold on. So here's the deal. God's word tells us what creates the environment where he wants to send his presence. So this is crazy. We get to set the environment. We get to create the environment that all of a sudden, yeah, but isn't God busy? Yeah, he's doing all these things, but all of a sudden he can hear something like, oh, there's a group of people, there's somebody, there's people over here that are, they're making a sound. There's, some, there's somebody that needs a touch from heaven. There's somebody that needs to be set free. There's somebody that needs to be forgiven. There's somebody who's... Make a joyful... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to practice it right now. And I want you to make whatever shout that you need God to respond to. And I'm not going to tell you what that is. Some of you are in a lot of need. Some of you don't need anything. You think. Let's make a joyful shout. So I'm going to count down from, I'm going I'm to count, I'm going to go one, two, three, and then we're all together. Some of you are so nervous. Don't be nervous. It's not about you. Let's make a joyful shout to God that demonstrates the need that we have for him. And I'm going to count down from five. Are you ready? Let's do it together. One, two, three. <laughs> I'm like, mm. I was thinking about, I was thinking about this Larry right here in the second row, knowing Larry my whole, Larry, he stayed for both, Larry jumped to his feet, Larry, I'm sorry, how old are you, see, I can tell it, 
60. Amazing. Been here since the beginning of the church. We were talking about, Larry, you jumped to your feet. I know why you jumped to your feet. He just found out that he's got a cancerous tumor on his kidney. They have to take it out. I think it might have spread other places. Oh my gosh, someone is here. When you're in need much, you worship my, you express, this is how I fight. This, I'm, I've got to create, I'm going to do whatever. And it's not, sh- that doesn't have to be shouting for everybody. I'm just telling you how God's word says, this is how you access my presence. You make a joyful shout to the Lord. You serve the Lord with gladness. That means God considers your serving with the right spirit worship. Then he says this, come before his presence with what? Singing, not praise. Hello, it's up. Come before his presence with singing. This is why we sing. We don't get to tell God how we want to come into the king's presence. We come into his presence with singing, enter his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. We don't have to guess. God tells us how to come. So this is why there's opportunities, by the way, in the worship service. Or you can hear the team up here and they'll be like, come on, worship the Lord. Or just sing before the Lord. And some of you are like, I sing. No, no, no. That's where you, he put a new song on my mouth. That's when you could just do it right now and be like, oh, Lord, we love you, God. It's the most, what's happening? I'm creating a sound that God's attracted to. Oh, I need you, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, would you fill me with your spirit? You see what's happening? I'm coming before the presence of the king and he's he's hearing my cry and now all of a sudden access, power, presence, environment is being set. The stage is being set. The table's being set. Listen for you to experience the presence of God. I'm going to show it to you in the New Testament. I'm, I'm done. This is why. Don't be drunk with wine, Ephesians 5 says, because that'll ruin your life. By the way, some of you, you're filling your life with things that are ruining it. Instead, what be filled? Don't don't lose me. Come on, come on. Instead, we're almost done. Instead, what be filled with the Holy Spirit? Josh, I want to be filled. I want to be filled how? Glad you asked. Next verse. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves. I love this. And also making music to the Lord in your hearts. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question. How do you get drunk with wine? So don't take off your halo. Somebody be like, I don't know. This is my first Sunday. I don't know how that happens. Sure, you know how it happens. How do you get drunk? You consume too much. You drink too much. Oh my goodness, don't miss this. We're going to close. In the same way, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you got to keep drinking. You got to keep singing. You got to keep praising. You got to keep worshiping. You got to keep singing. You got to keep lifting up your hands. You got to keep dancing. You got to keep shouting. You got to keep doing everything that you can to access and create an environment where the Holy Spirit wants to step into. We keep leading and we keep pressing. And if you feel empty today, we're going to sing. I'm, we're going to go back into this. And we're going to practice it. But if you're here, and you're like, man, Josh, this is, I can't do this. I feel, I feel empty. I'm empty. I'm, I'm, I, I don't feel any of this. Listen to me. God will always fill you to the level of your expectation the last one is that God will always fill you to the level of your expectation so if you're empty and you need a touch from heaven Jesus said blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake for they shall be filled they shall be filled come on stand to your feet right now every single person I want you to stand up I want you to bow your hands come on lift those hands high in the sky as high as you can